Welcome to Issues That Matter. I'm Cynthia Poole. My guest today is Scott Ritter, and Scott is going to update us on the situation in Russia. So um, when I spoke to you yesterday, you said, well, you thought it was over, but when I put the TV on this morning, you know, they were saying that um, they were talking about Putin. So I think it's far from over. What do you think? Well, when you say it, uh, that that's the key question. It's over. What's over? The rebellion's over. The mutiny's over. Prigozhin's treason is over. The act of treason is over. Uh, Wagner uh, mutinied against the uh, Russian government. Um, uh, Wagner carried out an armed insurrection against uh, the Russian government, and that armed insurrection um, has been crushed. Crushed. Now people say, "Well, wait a minute, Scott. Crushed? What do you mean crushed? There's no dead bodies on the street. Well, there's actually." 10 to 12 dead bodies, the dead bodies of Russian servicemen who were murdered by Wagner during their illegal march towards uh, Moscow. But, you know, there's people out there that are saying this, this, uh, this has made Putin weaker. Putin's weaker. I never saw a stronger president in my life than the president I saw on TV on Saturday who addressed this issue and made it very clear with his words that um, he called a spade a spade. Uh, this was treason. This was a mutiny. This was a stab in the back, and it would not succeed, he said. A lot of things happened that people didn't see. Um, as Putin was making that decision, um, you know, the, the Russian military, the Russian security services have been told, do not shed blood. Let's see what's going on. Let's see how this plays out. Uh, but when it became clear that Wagner was making a push to Moscow for the purposes, by the way, not of having a conversation. They were seeking the overthrow of the Russian government, plain and simple. The motivation for this, pure greed. Prigozhin is a businessman. People need to understand he is in the business of making money off the blood of Russians, off the blood of others. That's what a private military contractor does. And in the case of Ukraine, business is very good. Uh, Prigozhin has made a lot of money off of this war. Um, but the problem that Prigozhin was facing is that Wagner is a private military contract or, or organization that has no legal basis of existing on Russian soil. And although they were created in 2014 uh, to help the ethnic Russians resist the, um, the uh, criminal actions of the um, nationalist government in Kiev that took over after the illegal coup d'etat of the Maidan um, in, in February of 2014, once, um, once Russia uh, consolidated uh, the Donbass, Lugansk, Donetsk, and Novoye Russia, uh, Kherson, Zaporizhia, into Russia through a, uh, through a referendum in the fall of 2022, um, the, the territory that Wagner was fighting on was Russian territory. And again, I just bring people back to the fact that there's no legal basis for Wagner now. None. The Russian government allowed Wagner to continue its fight. In many cases, there's a reason to believe that the Russian government was actually trying to bring a pause to some of the fighting to get Wagner withdrawn uh, from the front lines to resolve this question of legality. And that Prigozhin continued the fight. People talk about why did Shoigu not provide Prigozhin with the ammunition that he was requesting? Well, because it's illegal to give a mercenary organization operating on the soil of Russia, ammunition. There's no legal way to do this. Prigozhin continued to push Wagner forward uh, in violation of the law to create a new reality. Uh, and then you saw that he, he combined this offensive operation with one of the greatest uh, propaganda and public relations campaigns, turning Wagner into a synonym for heroic entity, pro-Russian forces, the ultimate heroes of Russia, better than the Russian military, the best in the world, Wagner, you know, boom. And I'm not saying they don't deserve much of the accolades. They are very good fighters. The military commanders are professionals and the um, fighters that participated in this did so heroically and, um, and they, they accomplished a lot. But I think we're learning more about the motivations of Prigozhin. This was a business deal. He is not a Russian patriot. 
He is a narcissist. He is a businessman. He is a greedy oligarch. And he wanted more and more. And he recognized that if the Russian government got its way and demanded that Wagner comply with the law by signing contracts that made them work on behalf of the Ministry of Defense and not Yevgeny Prigozhin, because ask yourself this, what rank does Yevgeny Prigozhin hold? Nothing. He's never been in the military. He's a convict turned businessman, protege of uh, Vladimir Putin. He was the chef. Uh, Putin liked him, gave him opportunities. Uh, and Prigozhin, had he simply focused on the business opportunities that Putin gave him, uh, is and would continue to have been a very wealthy man. But instead, he got greedy. And then he started to believe his own propaganda about his value as a military leader, his value as a Russian leader. And he decided that he wanted to be president. Now, he'll claim otherwise, but you don't send 8,000 troops to uh, Moscow to challenge presidential authority unless you're seeking to usurp presidential authority. So, you know, the question of, you know, did he do this on his own? Was he colluding with foreign intelligence services? I think history will show that he was working um, in collusion with foreign intelligence services. There's too much collaboration taking place between the British, the Americans, uh, the Ukrainians, and Prigozhin's um, actions. Uh, but what triggered, Prigozhin has come out and he's he straight up admitted what, what happened. He said that um, the, the, uh, the Russian government was going to compel his, uh, his forces to sign contracts. And that would be the end of Wagner. And he said, we don't want Wagner to be over. And so we were going to move on, the on to the headquarters of the Special Military Operation, that is the Southern Military District in Rostov, and uh, confront Shoigu and Gerasimov, the ch chief of the Russian general staff, um, and compel them to change this outcome. Um, that's a mutiny. That's a fun. But this isn't a patriotic act. This wasn't designed to save Russia. This was designed to save Wagner as a money-making machine for Yevgeny Prigozhin. Yevgeny Prigozhin should go down in history as the traitor that he is committing an act of treason. And Vladimir Putin will go down in history as the president who avoided a civil war. Do you want to know why Prigozhin stopped? It's not that he suddenly had an act of conscience and he said, Oh, I feel sorry for what I did. He stopped because 2,500 Russian special forces were put out in the field in Serpikov. The initial reconnaissance elements of Wagner came up, saw them, reported back. They're waiting for us, dug in. They're going to kill us all. Meanwhile, Prigozhin got a phone call from Rostov that said 10 to 15,000 Chechen special forces have surrounded Rostov, are getting ready to come in, and they're going to kill us all. 8,000 Wagner people suddenly woke up to the reality they, that they were not immortal, that they were strung out on several hundred kilometers of highway, uh, effectively surrounded by forces loyal to Vladimir Putin, that nobody rallied to their cause. Not a single Russian politician said, I support Prigozhin. Not a single Russian commander in the field said, I support Prigozhin. No Russian units dropped their weapons and say, we support Wagner. And no a significant population came out and said, we support Wagner. Russia rallied behind its president, and it was clear, made clear to Prigozhin that you are a criminal. You are a traitor. Now, to avoid bloodshed, because what happens when you tell criminals and traitors that you're going to jail and they have guns in their hands? They're a cornered rat will fight. And Wagner was a cornered rat inside Russia. They would have fought. There would have been thousands, tens of thousands of deaths. But Putin gave them an out. Now, Putin can't. Remember, he's the president of Russia, so he himself can't make this deal. That's where Lukashenko came in, sat down, negotiated. So, but, but it wasn't a negotiation. I'll tell you exactly how it went. Lukashenko to Prigozhin, you're going to die, you traitor son of a bitch. <laughs> Prigozhin, how can I get out of this? Lukashenko, you're going to leave here. You and the 8,000 traitors are going to come into exile in Belarus, and we'll work something out. But um, you're done. You're finished. It's over. And Prigozhin went, OK, and he left. That was the negotiation. It's not Prigozhin putting demands on there. People were saying Prigozhin insisted that there be changes at the Ministry of Defense, that Shoigu be fired. It's never going to happen. If and when Shoigu leaves the Ministry of Defense, it'll be because Vladimir Putin made the decision as the president that that's what's going to happen. 
But I can guarantee you that even if Putin was thinking before this, maybe it's time to replace Shoigu, he will not act on it now because it will look like Prigozhin pushed him to do it. What leader can allow a situation where it, even the perception of the fact that he yielded to a mutiny, uh, that perception can exist? For Shoigu, is the minister of defense, he will continue to be the minister of defense. There's a lot of fantasy out there. He's under house arrest. He's being investigated for this and that and the other thing. Shoigu is the minister of defense. And I want people to reflect on this. On Thursday, before this, this mutiny, this treasonous act took place, um, the Russian army was winning. Remember, they were crushing the counteroffensive. The Ukrainians were in a pause because they couldn't attack anymore. They were wiped out, losing everything. <laughs> Russian defense industry is pumping out weapons at a great efficiency. Uh, they will never run out of ammunition. You know who's responsible for that? Shoigu. So the notion that Shoigu's incompetent, not up to the task, is absurd. This was not about Shoigu's deficiencies. This was about the greed of Yevgeny Prigozhin, who will go down in history as a traitor to Russia. There's a lot of people out there talking about Games of Thrones type stuff. You know, oh, this was a psyop. This was Maskarovka. This was 5D chess. What is 5D chess? It's just, just like their theories don't exist. Vladimir Putin is the leader of a nuclear state, Russia. He doesn't play games. He doesn't engage in Game of Thrones type conspiracies. Uh, what happened on Friday and Saturday was an embarrassment to Russia, an embarrassment to Putin, and he knows this. Remember, in the week leading up to this mutiny, there was the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum. Hundreds of billions of dollars of contracts were signed. Why do businessmen sign contracts in Russia? They want to invest in Russia. Cynthia, you know enough about business to know that uh, if I'm going to take a lot of money and invest it somewhere, I want the prospects of getting a return on mm -hmm. my investment. And I don't get my return on my investment in a country that's susceptible to armed mutinies and banana republic type uh, military insurrections. So anybody who thinks that Putin was a part of this, conspiring to have some game to isolate and identify, you know nothing about Putin. You know nothing about Russia. You know nothing about business. Putin was not a part of this. This is something Putin didn't want to have happen. When it happened, he acted decisively. It's been pinched off. It's over. But his job right now as a leader is to convince those who are going to invest in Russia that Russia is stable politically, economically, and that they will get good returns on their investments. That's very difficult to do when you have you know, thousands of mercenaries marching on your capital. Um, what does all this have to do with the war in Ukraine? Well, as we said on Thursday, um, Ukraine was losing. It was law. And, and, and again, nothing's changed. Just so people understand, nothing's changed on the front. No soldiers left the front lines. Uh, supply lines weren't cut. The Russians continue to slaughter the Ukrainians as they speak. But what we do know now, uh, and it's becoming even more clear, is that the United States and Great Britain were fully aware of what Prigozhin was planning to do and that they were taking action in anticipation of an outcome that they were hoping for a civil war. They wanted the violence. The Ukrainian government was told to hold off on certain operations at the front so that um, Prigozhin's you know, mutiny could expand, compelling the Russians to divert sources, resources from the front line, weakening the front lines, and then the Ukrainians would attack. This was all part of this grand scheme, not only to reverse the tide on the battlefield, but to achieve what the United States, Great Britain, Ukraine have been hoping for from the beginning of this, the Moscow Maidan moment, a moment when the Russian people rose up in the streets of Moscow and demanded Vladimir Putin's ouster. This is what they wanted. They wanted to time it in time for uh, the, the, the NATO summit in Vilnius that's scheduled to be on July 11th. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they, in a Hillary Clinton-like moment, had bought a lot of fireworks to uh, to celebrate Putin's demise. Remember, she had the big fireworks show to celebrate her presidential victory that didn't happen uh, because Donald Trump pulled the rabbit out of the hat and won. Well, Putin pulled the rabbit out of the hat. Prigozhin's mutiny is over. There was no disruption. Um, but the West, the collective West, British intelligence, American intelligence, uh, the Ukrainian intelligence were all part and parcel 
of this. They were colluding with Prigozhin, I believe wittingly. I believe that Prigozhin was working with them. I believe Prigozhin thought that he would succeed in overthrowing Putin and he would have the support of the world that would put him in position to be the president of Russia. Um, we haven't proven that yet, but we do know that they were aware of what he was doing. And here's the scary thing, Cynthia. This means, and, and, the, and, and the CIA has admitted that New York Times has reported on this, that the U.S. Congress was briefed on Prigozhin's mutiny before it happened, before it happened. They knew that this was going to take place. Russia is a nuclear armed state. Russia is a nuclear armed state that has a doctrine that says it can use nuclear weapons if the existential survival of the Russian state is at, at risk. So think about what happened here. We knew Prigozhin was getting ready to march on Moscow designed to overthrow the Russian government. Um, therefore, if you're Vladimir Putin and Prigozhin's marching on it and there's links to the West, this is an existential strive. There's no difference between Prigozhin's insurrection and a NATO army coming at Moscow, which means nuclear weapons would fly, the world would end. For all the idiots out there, and I call you idiots out of the bottom of my heart, because I mean it, for all you idiots out there who yeah. were hoping that Prigozhin's mutiny would achieve the overthrow of Vladimir Putin. Do you not understand that if Vladimir Putin were to be threatened, that he is the constitutionally elected leader of Russia, he would order the release of nuclear weapons to bring an end to the threat, not nuking Prigozhin, but nuking those who are giving Prigozhin his instructions. That's America, that's Europe, that's NATO, because as Vladimir Putin has said, a world without Russia is not a world worth living in. Now, People out here might disagree with that, but it doesn't matter. The president of Russia and the Russian state does agree with that. They have nuclear weapons that are designed to guarantee their continued survival. So anybody hoping for the collapse of Vladimir Putin's uh, government through some sort of armed insurrection, what you're hoping for is your death, and your death would be guaranteed. You know, the uh, possibility of nuclear war right now is so frightening because the symposium that you did with Diane on Friday night and you talked about nuclear war and you talked about what it would mean and then I woke up Saturday morning and I heard all this and I'm saying I said to my friend Russell we're going to be vaporized today <laughs> that's how frightened I was well you were right though uh you know Cynthia if if Prigozhin had succeeded, if the schemes had worked out, a lot of people don't realize that two days before Prigozhin's revolt, the Russian security services uncovered a Ukrainian uh, plot. They had uh, covert cells in Moscow who were preparing in coordination with Prigozhin's assault to carry out terrorist attacks in Moscow. Why would they do that? Designed to show that Putin is weak that Russia can't be safe under Putin. So they blow things up. And they. And another thing that happened is uh, messages were being sent out over the internet to the Russian population, encouraging them on, on Saturday to um, gather in uh, Manej Square, downtown Moscow. Why? To recreate the Maidan moment. The Ukrainian government working with the CIA and the British intelligence were urging Russians to come into Moscow center square to bring down the Russian government. Had this happened, let's say the security services of Russia didn't succeed. Let's say the Ukrainian terrorist cells started blowing up uh, buildings and infrastructure in Moscow. Let's say millions of Muscovites out of fear came to Minez Square and were demanding Putin's ouster. Let's say the Russian military lost confidence in Putin and joined Wagner driving on. You'd be dead now your fears would have been realized. We would have been vaporized with nuclear weapons. So this is why I call all the people out there, and again, out of the, the, the bottom of my heart, I mean this, you're the dumbest people in the world. <laughs> Anybody who is supporting the notion of violently uh, bringing an end to the Putin regime, of Russia losing this war, I pointed this out in the seminar with Diane Sayre, that we have called this struggle against Russia uh, we are seeking the strategic defeat of Russia. 
do we not understand that if we win, we die? That's what it is, guys. If we win, if we succeed in the strategic defeat of Russia, we die because Russia has a nuclear arsenal that is intended to deter against anybody strategically defeating Russia. And the key aspect of deterrence is to make sure that the threat promised, if something happens, can be delivered. And let's be clear here. Vladimir Putin will not hesitate to destroy the entire world if Russia's security, if Russia's uh, future, if Russia as a nation state is threatened. So we're saying we want the strategic defeat of Russia. Russia's saying if that happens, we will kill you. And we're saying we still want the strategic defeat of Russia. Who's the crazier one? Vladimir Putin for desire, for desire to use lethal force to save his nation? Or we, who are willing to sacrifice everything in the field to hope that somehow we can bring about his demise? I, I think the crazy ones are the ones on cable news because they're saying all this stuff about, you know, Russia's got to be defeated. And don't they know that they would be nuked as well as you and I would be? Well, there's two things they don't know. First of all, they clearly don't understand uh, the consequences of their desires, which is their imminent death. So either they're insane, uh, they're psychopaths, they're sociopaths, um, you know, people who have no concern for human life, which is a real possibility in the case of some of them, or they're ignorant, which I think is the more likely thing. These are some of the most ignorant people in the world about Russia, about Putin, about national security. Um, they, they, they don't understand that Vladimir Putin has publicly said that if the, if the existential, first of all, again, the idea of a world without Russia is unimaginable to him, meaning there will no, be no such thing as a world without Russia. A world without Russia is a world not worth living in. Reflect on that for a moment. And then he also said that if they think about the existential threat of you know, the defeat of Russia, if they use nuclear weapons against Russia, he said, then we will do what we need to do. Everybody will go to heaven. Or no, everybody will die, but we'll go to heaven as martyrs. Meaning he doesn't care. Hmm. He does care, but he's he's serious. People need to understand. There's a question again. There's a paper written by uh, Sergei Karaganov, um, a a um, a dated Russian academic who used to have influence with the Yeltsin government. Continues to have uh, his voice is heard. He's he is he is somebody who is listened to. He wrote a paper in a Russian journal uh, in which he talked about in the in the face of these threats being posed by the collective West against Russia, seeking the strategic defeat of Russia, that um, if Russia is unable to achieve a dramatic victory, a decisive victory in Ukraine, and this war continues to drag on and on and on, that eventually Russia would be exhausted by this, which means eventually, eventually the strategic defeat of Russia would become a possibility. And he said, at that point, we have to use nuclear weapons. He said, so why do we want to wait until that happens? Why don't we adopt a policy similar to that of the United States of nuclear preemption? Whereas rather than waiting for something to happen, we will preempt it with nuclear weapons. And he is proposing that Russia use tactical nuclear weapons against NATO under the premise that he put forward. Um, when Russia destroys Poznan, a city in Poland, the United States will not be willing to sacrifice Boston on behalf of Poznan, meaning that an American president would pause and say, well, wait a minute, if I, if I respond to this, I'm gonna lose an American city I don't want to do that. Therefore, I'm not going to act. This is the thinking. But I can tell you that whereas his analysis of an Amer of American presidential uh, leadership might be accurate, I do believe an American president would pause. The West's analysis of Vladimir Putin is absurd because they believe that Putin doesn't have the guts to pull the trigger. Ladies and gentlemen, Putin ordered the destruction of Wagner, the violent destruction of Wagner. Had Prigozhin not backed down, backed away, the fields of Russia today would be littered with 8,000 Wagner corpses. Tens of thousands of Russians would have died as well. But Putin was ready to do that. He gave the orders. It was happening. Putin will use nuclear weapons to save Russia. He will kill you. He may not be happy about it, but he's confident that he'll be in heaven in the pearly gates as a martyr, and you'll just be dead. 
reflect on that the next time you think that it's a good idea to seek the strategic defeat of Russia, mm. especially a Russia that poses no threat to the United States. I need to under, you know, underscore that. It's not as though I'm sitting here saying, oh, no, we, we need to let Russia run roughshod over America. I'd be the last person to do that. I'm somebody who's you know, joined the Marine Corps, willing to die for my country. And if Russia was trying to threaten my country, I guarantee you, I'd be at the front line telling the Russians, sorry, I wanted to be friends, but now you want to hook and jab. Let's do it. But that's Russia's not threatening us at all. We're threatening Russia. Do you think the Russians were uh, if, if, cheering on January 6th? That the Russians were sitting there going, yeah, baby, bring down the American government. This is awesome. No, they weren't. But we are sitting here going, yeah, Prigozhin, bring down Putin. Who's the, who's, who, who's the childlike actor in this? The United States. We're the ones to blame for everything that's happening. Wow. So it, it, you said you had to go. It's uh, a couple of minutes after. So I'm sure as this... Uh... This continues. You and I will have another conversation. You've been listening to Scott Ritter. I'm Cynthia Pooler. This is Issues That Matter. And if you like this show, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Um, Scott, have a great day. And Thanks, you too. we will talk later. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.